All right. Good morning. Uh, I'm Darnell Strom, and I'm probably not going to tell you anything new up here. Uh, I think we all know that culture has been influencing democracy probably since the beginning of democracy. Um, there are many examples throughout our, our country's history, uh, but today I want to help you think about it and its impact a little differently. So if we go to the next slide, an example from our country's history. President Lincoln famously said this, is this the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war? Since Tony Kushner is going to be speaking to us later today, I thought it was fitting to start with a Lincoln example. In the fall of 1862, and I know there are a lot of uh, social studies teachers in the room, so at the end of this story, give me a thumbs up if I have the historical context right. In the fall of 1862, President Lincoln uh, welcomed Harriet Beecher Stowe to the White House, and he greeted her with these words. Now, in order to understand the context of these words, we've got to go back 10 years to 1852, when Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. This book helped change and, in many cases, polarize hearts and minds around the issue of slavery. So we're going we're gonna to pause there for a second. I'm going to let you stew on that for a bit, and we'll get back to Harriet a little bit later. First, I want to tell you a little bit more about me and what it is that I do. So uh, I work at the Creative Artists Agency, which is an entertainment in sports agency in Los Angeles. Uh, one of my roles at CAA is in our foundation. The foundation at CAA has been around for 18 years. And at first we started just as kind of like a philanthropic wing to get our company and our employees more involved in the community. Uh, education has always been something that we we're passionate about and we've worked locally on that issue through communities and schools and nationally all the way up to the Department of Education on campaigns like teach.gov, which encourage young people to pursue a career in teaching. But our role evolved from there as more and more of our clients sought our advice on how to get involved in the social issues that they were passionate about. All of this is to say that our foundation is on the nexus between philanthropy and culture making. So we see on a day-to-day -day basis how democracy, or excuse me, how culture can influence democracy. Okay, now back to Harry Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin. The New York Times did a book review on Uncle Tom's Cabin in 2011 but I think it's fascinating that a, a book that was written in the 19th century is still relevant to modern uh, uh, book critics. They talked about Stowe and her background and how she you know, watched the debate going on on slavery in Congress and how it infuriated her. Um, and you know, she ended up writing, if you go to the next slide, she ended up writing a, a letter to the editor of a magazine uh, saying that the time has come when even a woman or a child who can speak a word for freedom and humanity uh, is bound to speak. And so from there, she started writing a series of sketches, fictional sketches, of slaves under physical and psychological duress and assault. Those sketches ended up becoming the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, it's very important to talk about the timing of this book. Stowe really inflamed the argument uh, and, and got both sides of, of this argument really riled up. In the North, you had longtime abolition, abolitionists like Frederick Douglass rejoicing, saying that this book was a baptism by hellfire to the myriads who never cared about uh, the bleeding slave. In the South, they had a different reaction. Uh, they thought this was just a malignant indictment of the institution of, of slavery. I think the influence of Uncle Tom's Cabin can't be underestimated. It elevated the conversation of slavery, deeply polarized the nation, and many people feel that that polarization is what led to the Civil War. The book was also a commercial success. Uh, millions of people around the world read the book. And at that time in history, it was the second most read book in the world, only to the Bible. Uh, the, the big advertising company, JWT, they were founded in 1864, and they cited the example of Uncle Tom's Cabin as one of the reasons why they got into advertising, because they learned that masses of people can be influenced by emotion via storytelling. All right, so on to the next example. Um, let's talk about public health for a little bit. We've all heard about these campaigns uh, over the last 30 years that promote, um, you know, buckling up, uh, you know, stop smoking, uh, you know, um, designated drivers. All of these things have become just natural into the psyche of Americans. A major part of that is because of the power of TV culture. Now, most of us think of TV as a way to just kind of escape from reality, relax or laugh, but I think we forget sometimes how it impacts the way we think and how it impacts the way we interact with the rest of the world. And for a lot of Americans, it actually is one of their top sources of, of health information. Um, and 
So this poll right here, which was done by the uh, Hollywood Health and Society, they teamed up with the Kaiser Family Foundation, and they found that 26% of Americans cited entertainment television, and I'm not talking about the news, I'm talking about sitcoms and, and scripted dramas as one of their top three sources for health information. Half of that 26% believed that the information that they got off these entertainment television shows was accurate. I know, it sounds scary. However, it is also a major opportunity. Organizations can take advantage uh, of this medium, harness that opportunity, reach a new audience, and have a way broader impact. So uh, Hollywood Health and Society uh, worked with a team of writers because most of, the, most of these storylines aren't a part of a, of a coordinated campaign. They're just you know, part of the creative process. Health storylines are entertaining, so, th so they write them. So Hollywood Health and Society teamed up with writers from, if we go to the next slide, these four shows to introduce storylines around organ donation. We all know that we have uh, you know, a, a low supply of organ donors in this country, and there's a lot of misinformation on, out there on what the process is. And entertainment TV is, has been a big part of that problem. So they teamed up with these shows, and this is what they did. All four of the shows introduced storylines around organ donation. All of them did you know, their, their own thing. It's important to point out that the sh TV show Numbers was the only one that gave viewers concrete examples and concrete information on how to actually learn more about being an organ donor and actually how to, uh, how to uh, sign up. So after these shows aired, uh, this, they did surveys of the viewers, and it's no surprise that the numbers viewers were the ones that were mo most likely to actually become organ donors. The other major factor was emotional connection to uh, the storylines that also drove people to wanting to sign up. So there are two things that I want you to take away from this example. One. Emotion can lead to action. Two, once you have people at that emotional point, it is important to give them tangible action steps on how to further get involved. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more at the end of my talk, but we're going to move on to the next example. Same-sex marriage. Next week is going to be a big week for the issue uh, as the Supreme Court hears two groundbreaking cases that might redefine the way the law uh, defines marriage. I think it's interesting to step back and see uh, how the pu public opinion has changed over the last 10 years. So this poll was done by ABC News uh, and the Washington Post, and in 2004, 55% of Americans were opposed to same-sex marriage, 41% approved. Now here we are nine years later, and those numbers have pretty much flipped. So 53% of Americans are now in favor, and just about 40% opposed. So how do we get there so quickly? The Human Rights Campaign has done some research, and they found that 8 out of 10 Americans now identify with knowing someone who's gay. As the LGBT community has felt more comfortable and safer coming out, that has had a major impact. Something else that I found very interesting was those people who were polled that said that they knew someone who was gay, some of those people were talking about characters on television. Seriously. <laughs> So it makes you think, and I, I read another report that psychology shows the way you relate to a character on TV is a, the, your brain works in the same way as relating to someone in real life. So TV shows like Ellen and uh, you know, Modern Family and Glee, these shows have had amazing impacts on how, on how we think. And I think even, even more importantly, the writers of these shows didn't write the gay character's storyline in as like they were different but normalize the character, and they experience the same highs and lows that we all do, making them very relatable. Another show that is, is maybe had a, just an amazing impact in particular was Will and Grace. So in 1996, the Defense of Marriage Act was, was enacted. In 1998 to 2005, Will and Grace ran on television. In 2004, Massachusetts legalized gay marriage. So in the run of Will and Grace, we went from DOMA being the norm to one state legalizing uh, gay marriage. The show was such an imp so impactful to one person, um, the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, that when he went on Meet the Press last year and, and pledged his support for gay marriage, he cited Will and Grace as one of the big impacts. So let's go to the next slide and roll this video. And by the way, my measure, David, and I take a look at when things really begin to change, is when the social culture changes. I think Will and Grace probably did more to educate the American public than almost anything anybody's ever done so far. So we all know what happened after that. Shortly after the vice president made his statements, 
The president then came out in support of same-sex marriage, making him the first president ever to support the issue. All right, so we're going to move on to the, uh, to the next topic, climate change. How many of you, by a show of hands, have heard of the film An Inconvenient Truth? Pretty much everyone. I would bet that not all of you have actually seen the film. But you can't deny how big of a cultural phenomenon that An Inconvenient Truth unleashed out into the world. It really elevated the conversation of climate change, not only in the U.S., but all over. And I think it's important, to, it's important to know that scientists and environmental groups have been working on this issue for years. All the fuel was in the, in, in the right place, but they needed a spark, and an inconvenient truth provided that spark. Our friends at Participant Media produced the film and also managed its social action campaign, and its impact was huge. I'm just going to rattle through a couple of, of, of things that the, that the film achieved. One, there are five countries now who have actually adopted the film as a part of their school curricula. So there are young people who are learning about climate change through the film. Uh, there's over 15 pieces of legislation around the world that were introduced on climate change because as a result of the film, they had over 100 partners, uh, both in the corporate side and in the NGO space, uh, who helped uh, back the, the social action campaign. So, I just want to clarify one thing. I'm not saying that entertainment is single-handedly solving problems, and culture is single-handedly solving problems. In fact, if, it's not for this, if it wasn't for the work of organizations and activists who are working on the ground on these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, those are the real heroes in all of this. And if it wasn't for them, a lot of the spark that culture provides wouldn't be possible because it's their infrastructure and expertise that really helps make things happen. And I say that because if you go back, Harriet Beecher Stowe needed the work of longtime activists like Frederick Douglass in order to be the voice of, of, that, of that movement after the spark of Uncle Tom's Cabin hit. Public health organizations are informing people and giving them resources on a day-to-day -day basis once they found out about a particular topic on television or film. We know that gay rights and gay marriage activists have been fighting for decades, giving writers you know, the confidence to actually include their stories uh, in scripts and in storylines on television. And I think we know that... Uh, the people championed Al Gore after the release of An Inconvenient Truth, but maybe more importantly, they championed the environmental groups and the scientists who have been doing this, you know, studies on this work for, for many years. So now, I know this all sounds like very ambitious, right? It's like, okay, all this entertainment and culture talk, you know, how, how is an organization going to have access to that? How the hell do you get Hollywood to care about your cause and, uh, you know, and get people to pay attention? I got a secret. You don't need Hollywood to do it. You can tell your own stories. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to give you three steps to decoding the art of culture making. Step number one, the art of storytelling. We're all, we all have the, a great storyteller inside of us. And maybe it isn't us, maybe it's in our organization, or maybe it's someone in our community. But find that person who can emotionally tell the story of the work that you do, and that's an important piece. It kind of goes back to the advertising company JWT from their founding when they said, Great masses of people can be influenced by emotion via storytelling. Number two is distribution. We live in a time now, because of social media, we can target the groups that we want to meet, uh, we want to reach, the audiences that we want to reach out to, and we can get them. We can get to them. It's no longer, you know, distribution is no longer something that is exclusive. Everyone has access to it. And the third thing, and the last thing, uh, is action, right? So now that you've told your story and it's emotional and you've reached the audience that, that you wanted to reach, make sure that you have some tangible action steps to get the people who you've now inspired to be involved in your movement. It goes back to that example from the TV show Numbers, how the folks who, because they gave those, those, uh, those on-ramps to action, people were more inclined to be involved. So if we all follow those three steps, we can all be culture makers. Thank you. Thank you, Darnell. That was uh, fantastic. And uh, what we'd like to invite you to do now in your table conversations is, in a sense, to fuse the ideas that both Jacob and Dar Darnell uh, have put before us. And here's what I would invite you to discuss uh, at your tables. What is a why question that you want to ask in public life and civic life? And how can you use culture to spread that question? Not all of us are, in fact, almost none of us are uh, uh, captains of Hollywood, but every one of us in our own sphere, in our own way, in different forms of media and different forms of engagement can shape the culture. 
So what is a why question that you want to ask, and how would you want to use culture and story to propagate that question? Uh, we'll come back in a few minutes. And before we start uh, uh, drawing out some of your uh, table conversation highlights, um, I first want to uh, um, ask uh, Jacob and Dar Darnell a question or two. Um, and, and Jacob, for you, just uh, so you put out this call for tweets, uh, did, did anybody respond? You guys are incredible. I think there are hundreds, actually, of CUI uh, responses. And, and maybe I'll just go through like the first a handful or whatever. Nadia says, C hashtag CUI, don't we put better food in our body? Uh, Mary Grobner, why corporate personhood? Nick Hanauer, uh, why does Paul Ryan think slashing support for the middle class will make the USA more prosperous? Uh, Riley Reagan, why do we make it so hard for immigrants to vote? What does citizenship really mean? Ryan Prosser, why is education reform often left uh, led by those not involved in education? There, there are so many. Uh, uh, Maha, why do we accept calling people illegal? Uh, just one or two more. Um, Kristen, a question for, for my son. Why is our education system so antiquated? Uh, uh, Aria, why the hell do we lock up so many nonviolent offenders? They make up 60% of our prison population. <clears throat> uh, and many, many, we'll do something with all of these because there, are, there is an extraordinary amount of them and they are so very good, so thank you. We are going to do something with these uh, um uh, at the end of, or after this conference and make sure they are published back to you uh, and can provide grist for further uh, conversation engagement. D Dar Darnell, one of the things we were chatting about here on stage in our own table this conversation <clears throat> was uh, the, the ways in which everybody in this room can be a culture maker. And, and w what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, and I, I touched on it a little bit at the, at the end of the talk, but there's, there are just a number of examples of things that have become larger cultural phenomenons that didn't start off, you know, in the entertainment world. If anything, the entertainment world came to them. I mean, I'll use an example from, from last year, and, you know, whatever your opinion is of, of Coney 2012, either way, if you look at the model of what it is that they did, where first they had foot soldiers of, of young people who've been involved with the organization for years, and those people acted as the distributors. So when they created the Coney 2012 video, which had, didn't have anyone, you know, any recognizable talent in it or anyone from entertainment in it, they created this video, they sent it out to their, their support base, and their support base then acted as the distribution pad, where they sent it to family members, put it on their Facebook page, they tweeted it, and we saw just kind of the viral effects of it. Uh, and there are a number of campaigns that, that do that well. But I think it's one, you gotta have the emotional story and then you gotta have that distribution model and then they gave people the action step. And I'll give one more quick example. Since yesterday was World Water Day, the organization Charity Water, they have been extremely successful in raising money to help you know, uh, drill wells in the developing world because they're so great at communicating their story. And their connection between their donors and you know, them sending videos of children drinking water for the first time, clean water for the first time, those things are, are what, what make you know, the word spread. And, th and I think that's what culture making is these days. Everybody here today can be a Harriet Beecher Stowe, in a way, given today's technology and the democratization of, of media. So let's, uh, let's hear from some folks at various uh, uh, tables here. Um, we've got, oh, Sinead. And let's make sure we <coughs> cover the center of the room, too, with okay. somebody. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Christian McGuigan from Participant Media. Darnell, thank you for the shout out. Uh, we had a very inspiring conversation here with Emily from the Fledgling Fund and some inspiring students from uh, Bellevue College. And what we started talking about was the why of why is it taking so long to get um, a women's roles in society and getting men involved in that conversation. But really our conversation transitioned to the role of advertising that plays, uh, particularly on television when we're watching a show that's inspiring and has this social action message and then whether or not people are taken out of that situation when the advertising starts rolling, and whether or not that compromises the show's message when we might see advertising that is perhaps antithetical to the message that's being portrayed on the show, and then uh, the role that that might play with children, and children not being able to distinguish between advertising and the actual programming in involved. So we got into a really inspiring conversation around the role of advertising. Would love Great. to speak Great, Th thank you. Let's, let's uh, qu quickly hear from a, for a few more. We have one right here in the center of the room, Janae. Um, and uh, here comes the mic. Please introduce yourself. You'll hold it. Yes. yes, so I don't hold on too long. <laughs> um, Carol Coe, and my question, I'm going to say the question first, then I want to give some background information, and then say it at the end. I'll keep this to a minute. Why do the Common Core state standards for education in Washington State and 45 other states 
why do those standards call only for college and career readiness and leave out civic readiness? That's the question. My background information I want to share with you is um, that teachers who are charged to carry out those standards and the money that's being put in to get teachers ready to do that is focused on two disciplines, English language arts and math. I would argue that to, you can be college and career ready and not have a civic bone in your body. And so I really want to add civics to the common core requirements for education in this state and across the nation. So the question, why do the common core state standards not require civic readiness? Great Thank question. I, I, I see the beginnings of a movement right here. The beginnings of a movement. Uh, over here on this side, Chris. Hi, my name is Nikki Warnicky, and I'm here with YTech and Puget Soundoff. And a lot of what we do, Darnell, hits on your three points of decoding the art of culture making. And your note of distribution is really wonderful because it does mention that citizens are able to contribute to a, like, a discussion because of media and access. But my question is, why is an internet access a public utility because so many populations are left voiceless without a, like any opinion, without any space to let their voice be heard. And I think that that is not democratizing. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, an another one from over here, uh, uh, Chris, if you can make it uh, to, to this side of the room and then we'll swing back to the other side. Hello there, um, I'm Vincent from the University of Washington. Uh, this table, we really, we want, I want to touch base for, on both of your points. Darnell, um, I want to talk about the, your notion of culture uh, making, but we kind of talked about maybe this dynamic of culture changing. I mean, to use Coney 2012, you had, the, you had the story, you had the distribution, you had the call to action, but it was after one week, didn't hear anything about it anymore. Or you hear the messaging of, let's give to Haiti, let's give to Japan, all that kind of stuff. But after that, we still don't know what's going on. And I, this is where I want to draw to Jacob's point about the Why Tuesday. He's been doing this stuff for years, or the organization has been doing stuff for years. So uh, I just wanted you guys' uh, feedback on if you were to adapt your thing from the art of decoding and decoding the art of culture making, uh, changing, uh, changing, I mean, and how that relates to the idea of sustainability of the three courses of actions that you proposed. Great. So in our last uh, minute or so here, I'm going to ask you each to speak for just, you know, just 30 seconds about this key question yep. here of sustainability, right? So you ask why, which is a profound imagination expanding, convention breaking thing to do, right? You use the power of story to activate emotion and to get people to, to take initial action. But then how do you sustain, right? How do you build from that? I think that the power of storytelling has always been the same, but the, the method and the, and the, uh, the way that you communicate these stories has changed. Even for us, since Y Tuesday started in 2005, uh, I think we launched Y Tuesday uh, right after South by Southwest when Twitter first came out. And we didn't know how to use Twitter. We didn't know what it was. YouTube just started. Um, and we started uploading some of those videos that you saw. Um, and as the technology changed and as um, the tools begin to be began to become different, we would stay up to date with that stuff. So, you know, we would get politicians that supported us, like Mike Bloomberg, to start tweeting for us. Um, we would use uh, YouTube in a different way. We would start to do partnerships, like with participant media on projects. You just have to stay up to date with, uh, frankly, the technology. And as the technology changes, um, it, it's an extraordinarily powerful tool. Any thoughts on sustainability, Darnell? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you, you know, you mentioned some of the, uh, the, the larger movements that have happened, and they kind of teeter off. I think, you know, the news media, are, they're going to cover things for a fixed period of time. But sustainability comes from people. If you sustainably care and are, are screaming about a certain issue after it's hit that kind of cultural moment and you continue doing it, it's going to continue with coverage. I think oftentimes, though, people's interests kind of teeter off and the media attention teeters off and then, you know, it kind of goes back to where it was before. But I think it's upon all of us to continue beating that drum once we've, once we've had that moment. Because the moment can last only for a brief period of time, but you can extend that window if you've got like a collective group of people who stay, stay at it and stay the course. We're going to pick up this theme of sustainability actually in just a few moments, but uh, please join me in thanking Jacob Soberoff and Darnell Strom. Thank you. Thank you.